Welcome to New England Authors with Camille Nasser. So good to be with you here. Uh, we try to bring our stories of all the New England region here. And today we have a really wonderful writer, uh, Edwin Hill. Edwin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You wrote this wonderful debut novel called Little Comfort. Really enjoyed it. It was a kind of a psychological thriller for you, uh, for me, I thought. Was it psychological for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely it's a psychological thriller. Uh, now, you um, you grew up on books. You're, you're a book person yourself. You're an editor of textbooks. Yes. Is that right? Yep, I work for Macmillan. I work for a division of Macmillan called Bedford St. Martins, and I work on uh, mostly on composition textbooks. Uh, you mean uh, for English literature? Yeah, type for of English books? English composition. Yep. Uh, has has that changed over the years? <laughs> I taught English comp uh, ages ago. Yeah. Sure. I think the way any the way anyone consumes con uh, content now has really changed. Right. The way all people consume content. The way we we access television, the way we access books, and certainly the way we access uh, textbooks. I, I want to talk about your book, but I, I just can't uh, resist asking the question, how has textbooks, how have textbooks changed now? Well, we offer a lot of the content online now. Uh, we offer uh, more integrated uh, experiences for students now. Um, think about the way a student writes, so the way when, when you're writing, yeah. the main text in a course is going to be the, the, the actual writing of the student's writing, not, not the book that you're using. So we find different ways to help students interact with that, with that writing. So you, uh, then you made this change. You went to, uh, um, to fiction, to write your own fictional book. How was that? Was that was difficult? It, to go from editing to writing? Yes. Sure. I mean, like writing, uh, writing was something that uh, I always had wanted to do. Um, and it was something that I had um, tried to do a few times and had a few false starts. And uh, when I decided to write this book, it was sort of a long process to deciding to really commit to writing the book. Uh, but when I finally decided to jump into it, it was a pretty exciting experience. And I was really grateful to have all the editorial experience that I've had in my pro my professional life. Did, did you have one of your friends edit this one at, at uh at, um, at your work or is it? No, not at my work. I mean, no. any writer, um, any writer is going to have what's called beta beta readers right. who, who look at a manuscript during the early processes of drafting it, and I have these my are friends, uh, friends yes, and and, and colleagues and other writing yes, colleagues. Yes, um, and they look through the manuscript. They give you direction. You want to find beta readers who uh, who you trust and who can tell you when something's not working. But then you need a, pr a real professional editor who is uh, distance and not going to tell you, oh, what a wonderful job. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yep. that's, that's well, what's... you also get that through the rejection process. Uh, and then uh, you grew up uh, mysteries, reading mysteries all yeah. the time. So this is a, a, a mystery uh, itself. Um, and uh, uh, what were some of the people that really inspired you? Oh, um, sure. I mean, I, I think a lot of mystery writers come back to Agatha Christie, uh, you know, one of the one of the classics. Um, I uh, I remember reading my very first Agatha Christie novel, which was called The Seven Dials Mystery. I read it on a uh, camping trip with my family, and I just heard, I I was maybe ten or eleven when I found it, and. Um, I remember reading the story and being so fascinated by the world that she created. Um, uh, Seven Dials Mystery is one of her early mysteries. It takes place in the 20s, so you have the big manor houses where parties happen. Right. But I was really, I, the, the plotting of the story was so fascinating. And uh, I was just completely wowed by the end of the novel. Mm. Um, and I finished it, and I thought to myself, that is exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. And it only took me about 35 years to teach myself how to do it. <laughs> 35 years, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to write this, actually? The actual, was it a year or No, or? this book, I mean, this book, I started through fits and starts. So the, the first inspiration for the book was the uh, Clark Rockefeller case. And I just looked it up. It, that happened in 2008. So that's really when I first started this book. For those who don't remember, Clark Rockefeller was that man he pretended to be a, a member of the Rockefeller family. Right, yes. um, he married a wealthy woman. They had a child. And then when his story started to unravel, uh, he went on the run with the child. And it would turn into this media sensation. Um, I saw that story on the TV, and I thought, that is such a great story. That yeah. could really turn into a novel. And so I sat down at my kitchen table, and I wrote mm, maybe a three-page scene. It was about a guy named Sam. Right. I didn't quite know who Sam was, but I knew he was leaving town because he had committed some crime, yeah. but I didn't know quite what crime it was. Right. Um, 
and I liked the scene. And I kept returning to it. I, you know, I sort of wrote it. It sat on my computer. Yeah. Every now and then, I'd pick up my computer. I'd pick up. I'd open up that scene. I'd read it and think that is great, but I wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, then a couple of years later, I got a new job. I got my current job at, at Bedford St. Martin's, and I happened to be able to negotiate a month off in between my old job and my new job. And I thought, I've always wanted to try this writing thing. Yeah. I'm going to take that month. I'm going to try and see where this goes. And so I sat down every day that month. Um, I wrote a few thousand words every day. By the end of the month, I had uh, maybe 30, 35,000 words, which is about a third of a novel. Yeah. And um, I would worked out a few things. And even then, I sort of sat on it for a couple of years while I decide whether I wanted to commit emotionally to yeah. uh, trying to write something. Yes, a novel is, is usually uh, 30, uh, I'm sorry, 60 to 90,000 words. Um, uh, now, uh, Sam appears in this story. He's a very mm -hmm. important part of the story. But the main character is a, uh, a woman called Hester. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hester, right? Yeah. And um, she uh, she's a librarian mm -hmm. at in Harvard University. She's got a little side gig going where she finds uh, missing persons. Yeah. Now her business is going to downhill slightly because now everybody on the internet could find uh, people, right? Uh, but she comes up with uh, uh, one case. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Sure. So Hester. Um She's hired by random people who contact her to find missing people. And one of the things she knows is that um, in this day and age, to be missing, you really have to work at it, right? We have, this, we have these data trails that follow us everywhere. Um, so she's hired by a woman named Lila Blaine to find her brother, uh, Sam, Sam Blaine, who um, went missing about 12 years earlier with his friend Gabe. Um, and the story isn't really about the process of Hester finding Sam. She's actually pretty good at this. Yeah. Um, the story is about the aftermath of what happens when you find someone who really has no interest in being found. And Sam is someone who doesn't want to be found. I think uh, she finds Sam uh, in the second chapter, right? It's, <laughs> it's, in, the, very, it's very, in the third chapter. The third yep. chapter, yep. very, very early on. Uh, and she finds them here in uh, um, New England. Now, what, what I really liked about this book is it's very New England-based. Uh, part of it takes place in New Hampshire. Parts of it takes place in Boston. And, um, and you have, um, I think, the Public Garden at, at one time. You have uh, uh, Lake Winnipesaukee, was yep. it? And uh, so it, it really uh, uh, was grounded to me when I read this uh, I really liked reading, and also in San Francisco, which is where I grew up. Uh -huh. So uh, I really liked just all the locations that, that you have there. Did you kind of plan this as a New England uh, story? Was was the Rockefeller story New England, by the way? No, no. no, no. Um, I, yeah, I planned it to be in New England because that's what I know. I mean, this is where I live, um, coincidentally. I like going up to the Lakes District. Oh, I like I, Boston. I used to live in San Francisco, shockingly enough. Oh, I, um, I love I love going through the Public Garden during during the uh, the Boston Public Garden during the year because you have all the different uh, flowers going yeah. on. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. one of the things I love about New England is that you can go from urban. So a lot of the story takes place both in Somerville and also on Beacon Hill, and then you can get very rural and very rugged very quickly. And one of the things I wanted to do in this novel was explore. Or that dip, the different terrains of New England and, and how, how um, varied they can be. So this this woman comes down from New Hampshire, hires uh, Hester to find her brother, whose name is Sam, and. Um, uh, tell us a little bit. But I don't want you to give away the story because it's a really good story. And as I said, uh, the psychology of this is is very interesting. But tell us what. Tell us a little bit as much as you can about what happens in the story. Sure. Well, I mean, I'll say this. Sam is someone much like Clark Rockefeller who can morph from one person to another. He mm -hmm. knows how to get into a situation mm -hmm. and he knows how to manipulate the people in that situation. And then he usually knows when to get out of that situation as well. In addition to Clark Rockefeller, I'd say a big influence on this novel is Pat Patricia Highsmith, uh, Tom Ripley, um, the talented Mr. Ripley. Mm -hmm. um, Sam also has a friend who's with who travels with him, whose name is Gabe, and Gabe is almost the antithesis of Sam. Sam is very gregarious, uh, he's very outgoing, he's very handsome, whereas uh, Gabe is very reserved um, and uh, and almost 
uh, almost scary when you first meet him. Um, and I like to I like to sort of play with the, the the two characters to see how they would interact with each other and how they'd play off e each other. Now, uh, uh, you said that a person to get lost these days really has to work at it. And Sam is very good at this. He changes his name. He changes his location. Uh, as you said, he manipulates people, especially rich people. Um, uh, how, how does where does he go around? Uh, I mentioned he goes to San Francisco. Where oh, sure. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. He goes to um, he goes to San Francisco. He yeah. goes to Baltimore. Yeah. He's been in Chicago yeah. and he's been in New York City before yeah. he. And obviously, he started out in New Hampshire. Yeah. And then he winds up in Boston for yeah. the majority majority uh, of the story. And 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 he has a different identity every time. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, um, so the uh, Hester finds this. This person, as she's commissioned to do, and you would think that's the end of the story, chapter three. That's the end of the story, but it isn't. Uh, she as Hester holds on because there's something suspicious that go that's going on. Because uh, the person that that has hired her, that, which is Sam's sister, um, is not uh, is not upfront about why she wants to find Sam. Right? Tell no, us story. I, I don't want to talk too much about you, that. Yes. That gives a little bit away. Uh, um, but I do. I would say that Hester. What uh, Hester? I think is um, Hester is in a place in her life where she feels a little unmoored. And one of the things about this, and she feels very lonely. Um, and one of the things about this case is that it gives her something to do. So one of the central parts of this story is that Hester has a um, longtime partner. His name is Morgan. Um, she calls him her non-husband. And um, Morgan has a twin sister named Daphne, who is Hester's best friend. And Daphne has a child, a three-year-old child named Kate, who she's abandoned and left with Hester and Morgan. Yeah. So Hester, who is a 36-year-old woman, she has no interest in having children, um, is suddenly saddled with this three-year-old child who she has to drag around with her everywhere. Um, and she's looking for something to just dig into and something to distract herself from from where she is in her life and sam provides that distraction well um we're talking with uh edwin hill this is a uh, his debut novel called little comfort it's uh, it's a really good read i really enjoyed reading it we want to get to the psychology uh behind it but um i found that a very strange part of the book where she is given control of this three-year-old kid um, that's not something mothers do generally is is give away their three-year-old kid for a while uh, what why inspired you to to put that in the story is it something unusual what does it tell us about Hester and so on well I wanted Hester to be challenged um, and I wanted her to be challenged by uh, choices that weren't necessarily hers. Um, we touch on why Daphne left and why uh, she she left this child behind. Um, the second book, which I just finished, which is called The Missing Ones, actually explores that much deeper. Okay, we're going to talk about that in, uh, towards the end. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You know, I wanted Hester to be challenged by by life. Um, she is a 36 year old woman. Uh, she's consciously decided not to have children, and all of a sudden she is responsible for a three-year-old child who she doesn't necessarily want. And I think one of the interesting parts of the story is that she's ambiguous about having this child uh, with her all of the time. She doesn't necessarily enjoy being around children. She doesn't necessarily want this child here. But she also is an adult and realizes that this responsibility is hers whether she wants it or not. Mm. And that's one of the challenges that she really has to face in the story. Mm. Now tell us uh, about, you, you mentioned Sam and Gabe, the two, uh, the two young men who went off, well, they're 14 years old, I think, when, yep. they, when they ran away from home and went off onto adventures. Uh, you mentioned that they're opposites. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about their interaction and uh, what, what kept them together for so many years? Sure. I mean, one of the things that kept, one of the things that this novel really is, it explores is loneliness. Um, yes. I think it's one of the. Um, I mean, I'm not a lonely person, but I understand what it means to be lonely. And I think each of the three main characters, the three main characters are Hester, Sam, and Gabe. They they each approach loneliness in a different way, and that fear of loneliness. And so, um, uh, Sam approaches loneliness by 
just wholeheartedly going into these 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 new lives that he creates and um, and really trying to create something really special whenever he creates one of these lives. The lives tend to go wrong and he needs to leave in the mm-hmm. long run, but while he's there, he's fully committed to it. Gabe, on the other hand, is a is a, an introvert. He's somebody who um, he cherishes Sam as a friend because yeah. Sam was really the first person who ever saw him as a person. Mm. And so what is happening between Sam and Gabe, they're 25 years old when this, when this novel, in the present day of this novel. And what happens is that they're both dealing with choices that they've made in their lives, um, pretty dramatic choices that they've made in their lives. And they're, they're coming to a crossroads, as lots of people do when they, when they get to be 25 years old, and they have to decide where they want to go as people. And Sam wants to go in one direction, and Gabe wants to go in another, and that really kind of drives a lot of the story. Now, what's interesting is that uh, when, when Sam is away to all these other these places, he sends postcards regularly to his sister. And uh, 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 could you tell us a little about uh, why he does that and uh, what's the nature of his relationship with his sister? Sure. Yeah. Um, Sam left town because he, he needed to, but he also left town because he wasn't wanted, and he knew that he wasn't wanted. And I think he sends the postcards to his sister uh, on a regular basis just to remind her that he's there and to remind her that he's not invisible and that the problem that he was to her hasn't disappeared. Now, um, S- Sam is gay, right? Yeah. Uh, um, or that... is he? Uh, I would say Sam is more omnisexual. He um, is very handsome. He's very gregarious, and he uses sex whenever he needs to mm-hmm. y- needs to get ahead. Um, I think if he had to put himself into a category, he would say that he was gay. No. Uh, so, uh, what keeps them together, Sam and Gabe? These two opposite uh, people. They need each other. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the story is that. Um, when you really pull apart who has the power in the in the relationship, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sam seemingly has the power, right. but Gabe actually has some of the power as to power as well. When you look at um, what what gives people power, money gives people power. The only one of the two of them that makes any money, the one who has sort of created a career for himself, is Gabe. Gabe is a computer programmer. He works out of his home, and uh, he's the one who pulls in the money and funds this life that they live. Uh, but he doesn't understand that that gives him power. Um, and Sam probably does understand that it gives him power, but doesn't want him to know. So um, things are not what they seem to be. There is um, um, uh, a crime that happened some time ago. I don't want to give away the story. I've been accused of doing that a few times. Uh, but can you tell us a little, uh, as much as you can, what, what's, uh, what's involved? Why did they run away and so on? Uh. Oh, sure. Well, what can I tell you without giving it away? Um, there is a crime committed. Yeah. They live on a lake. Uh-huh. There is a crime committed on that lake. Right. Uh, it's very violent and gory, and uh, it necessitates that they leave in the middle of the night and never come back. Yeah. Yep. And, and change their identity and so on. So um, you, you mentioned you got another novel coming out. Is, is Hester going to be in, in that novel as well? Oh, yeah. 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 So the second... Uh, this is the Hester Thursby mystery series. The, that's what the publisher calls it. Uh, the second book is called The Missing Ones, and it also has Hester as the center centerpiece. Finding finding missing people. Finding missing people again. Uh-huh. I don't want to give too much away, yeah. uh, but it takes place on an island off the coast of Maine. Uh, the island is based on a Monhegan Island, though it's I, I wound up giving it a fictional name. Um, and Monhegan Island, for those of you who don't know, is a tiny little island about eight miles off the coast of Boot Bay Harbor. Um, they don't use cars there, and oh. it's a really fun place to visit in the summer. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's good. i would be looking forward. When's that coming out? Is it it comes out in uh, September of 2019. Oh, I see. Okay. So this is uh, New England Authors, and we're speaking with Ed- Edwin Hill, and we're talking about his, his, his wonderful novel. And uh, are you in a writing group? Is that how you, is that how you write? Um, no, no, I mostly write on my own. I mean, I have a very, very demanding uh, full-time job. Oh. Uh, so I write um, on the weekends and in the morning from 5 to 7 a.m., and um, I, 
again, I have beta readers who will read something once it's complete, uh, but I don't work with a writer's group. I actually find, for me, writer's groups sort of um, paralyze me a little bit. Oh, uh, but, but you've been working so long in, in, in writing and editing, right? Can, what advice would you give to someone who is, uh, wants to write a book? Oh, sh I, I'd say a couple of things. One is just stick with it. Try writing every day, which is, can be a daunting task, but even if you just write a couple sentences, it keeps you engaged in the material. I always think of publishing. Remember, writing and publishing are two different things. Writing is, is a craft and publishing is a business. Mm. And so I always, think of, um, I always think of writing and publishing relating to each other as being a series of portals. Um, the first portal that you have to get through is writing the material, so finishing the material. Um, so you want to work on a novel until it's done until you really, really believe it's done. And you need the support system that tells you that that novel is done. The next portal is that you need to find an agent. The next portal is that you need to find a publisher. Uh -huh. And the last portal is that you need to find an audience. And each uh -huh. of them becomes um, more challenging as you go forward. So make sure that you're done with each portal before you go on to the next one. Yeah, but I would like to add one thing. I would like to add, if you feel like you want to write, then do write. Uh, because the, do, would you agree with this, that you learn about yourself uh, when you write? Would you agree oh, with that? Oh, absolutely. I think so uh, what, what did you learn writing, writing um, a little comfort here? Well, I mean, I mean the basic, one of the things that I learned is that I could do this. Uh -huh. And I think that's one of the things that you have to convince yourself as you're going forward. I think lots of writers are just crippled by self-doubt, myself included. Um, I'm, I was crippled by self-doubt on my first book, and I was crippled by self-doubt on my second book, and I just signed a contract for my third book, and I can already, see, I can already feel the self-doubt happening. So that happens to all writers, and you just sort of learn, to ha learn how to work your way through that. But... Um, what else did I learn about myself? You know, I learned that I could be a, a creative, a creative person, that I could think my way out of problems. Writing is really just a series of of um, uh, problem solving exercises, right? You come up against a wall, you don't know what to do with the with the plot, and you just have to find a way to think your way through it and get around it. Now, I, I talked about um, th this being New England based and 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 so on, and and you just mentioned plot, but to me, I think. Um, your book is more about character. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, I like it to be about plot and character, I have to say. Uh -huh. um, when I first, I had another book that I wrote many, many years ago, uh, and it was more literary fiction. Mm -hmm. I got an agent for it. Uh, they shopped it around uh, New York and uh, didn't go anywhere, didn't sell. Uh, it was very discouraging. But um, it was what I, what I, tried to do with that novel was I wanted it to be a crime, I wanted it to be crime fiction, but I didn't fully commit to it. And I think that was one of the reasons why it never sold. So when I, when I, sold, when I started writing this book, I said, I'm just going to fully commit to writing the crime fiction. It's going to be character driven. It will, you know, th there'll, be, there'll be good characters who come out of it. Um, but I want there to be a plot there that you follow. Now, uh, I think you're one of the best people that can ask this, uh, answer this. Uh, there's a lot of difference between writing fiction and writing nonfiction. Uh, you deal with uh, nonfiction <laughs> all day long. Um, and what's the, some of the differences that you find when you, when you do go to fiction? Um, oh, well, the nice thing about, the really nice thing about fiction is that you can just make it up. Yeah. Uh, so if it, and you know. Oh, some, that's the hard thing as well. Well, it is a hard <laughs> thing too, but I mean, with nonfiction, you have to do the research. It has to be based on research. It has to be based on fact. Um, and that can be challenging too. With you, you have so much freedom when you write fiction to just go wherever you want. I mean, you see this in, you know, my, my novel is based in the, the real world, it's, and it's based right now, and it's based in a real place. But with fiction, you can take someplace anywhere. You see that in, in science fiction, you see that in lots of different things, and that's really freeing and exciting. And, uh, and your second and third books, are they too based on some uh, uh, incident that you, you read about? The second one isn't. The uh -huh. second one is, um, well, sort of. The second one has uh, addresses the opioid crisis that's been going around a uh, little bit. Uh, I um, see, I um, see. And then the Have third you. one is based, when I, was, uh, when I was young and I lived in San Francisco, I worked for a for-profit university. Uh, uh, for-profit universities are like the University of Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, this was a very small one. It was family-owned. And it was, um, it was just like the weirdest place you, you yeah. could possibly imagine. And I 
I, I only was there for maybe six months, and when I left, I always thought I always thought that's going to make a really good novel. Yeah. And so the third one is sort of based on the ex very loosely on my experiences there. Well, Edwin Hill, it was so good to have you here. This is our New England authors. Uh, we record here in Cambridge. We broadcast all around um, uh, New England. We're very interested in stories. If you want to get in touch with us, please contact us through your local station. And remember, watch locally. Thank you. Thank you. Edward.